So, you want to write mythic xenofiction. Well, arguably the most important and interesting of the genre's traits involves envisioning what types of societies different species might develop. For instance, the rabbits of Richard Adams' Watership Down have a complex series of myths that aim to explain why it is they seem to exist solely to feed most of the rest of creation, and prize underhanded cunning over bravery or strength. On the other hand, the foxes of Brian Carter's A Black Fox Running find honor in perishing at the hands of the hunt, which they consider the good death, as opposed to the agony of poisoned baits and traps, or the slow creep of age and disease. The cultures of both the foxes and wolves of Gary Kilworth's trio of loosely related xenofiction books rely heavily on scent, and the former revere the winds that carry knowledge to their noses, performing elaborate scenting rituals that double as safeguards against danger. The eagles of William Horwood's Kalanish long to return to the open skies of their homeland after being captured and caged in a zoo, while the deer of David Clement Davies' Firebringer maintain a rigid social structure cloaked in tradition and prophecy. Not all xenofiction needs to have complex cultural worldbuilding, but for authors wanting to write mythic xenofiction, crafting unique, intricate, and internally believable societies can go a long way towards providing a strong foundation for your story, characters, and themes. Alternatively, you could just pay lip service to creating an animal society, and then maybe years later, some random guy with a bird avatar on YouTube will spend an hour and a half ripping your book apart. Take your pick. So, think of this video as a sort of workshop on world building and mythic xenofiction. First, I'll be delving into the different aspects that go into creating fictional animal societies, and then afterwards, I'll brainstorm a few of my own as a little world building exercise. And for anyone out there looking for inspiration, feel free to use any of these ideas in your own stories. Also, to clarify, for the purposes of this video, I'll be assuming that viewers will be interested in writing stories that maintain at least a decent semblance of realism. Obviously, if you want to write a story about pack-hunting cheetahs that live in the Arctic and feed exclusively on pine cones, no one is stopping you, and it could hypothetically be well written, but here, I'll be working within a framework of keeping things mostly in line with real life. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. You know how I love to throw around that fancy verisimilitude term, right? So, first things first, choosing a species. The species you select for your story will determine, or at least play a large role in shaping, almost every aspect of your narrative. From the societies the characters live within to the things they eat, and from the biomes they inhabit to where they exist in the food web. Something that we, sitting at the top, don't really have to think about all that much. Species choice will also likely narrow your options for the type of story you end up telling. For example, if you choose to focus on urban foxes, which are mostly solitary, your story probably isn't going to feature the large-scale battles or societal upheaval found in Watership Down. But that being said, species selection doesn't need to determine your story. You can start with a narrative in mind, say, following a group of animals who are driven from their idyllic home by habitat clearing, a common feature of the genre, and then select a species that makes sense for said narrative. Or you can start with a species first and work out the details of the story itself later. For instance, discovering that there are species of Australian eagles that utilize fire as a tool to burn fields and flush out prey, and thinking someone needs to write a story about them. Those are real, by the way, and someone actually does need to write a story about them. Also, quick aside, just because a story, even a popular one, features a species you're interested in writing about, don't let that discourage you. Hunter's Moon and A Black Fox Running are quite distinctive, and quite good, despite both centering on foxes. I've lost track of the number of xenofiction novels starring wolves. And even Watership Down wasn't technically the first book to portray rabbit societies in some form. That distinction goes to the hyper-obscure 1948 novel The Wind Protect You, which I paid way too much money to get on eBay. Come again, sir! I'm getting back in line! And as a semi-relevant side note, this is how I originally approached my own novel, Winter Without End, which is available for purchase now from Fenris Publishing, link in description. Yeah, yeah, I knew that already. My book isn't quite mythic, it's more realist xenofiction, but I started out wanting to tell a story similar to the Plague Dogs. I took that book's concept of dogs learning from a wild animal, combined it with the motifs of de-domestication and adaptation to a harsh environment from The Call of the Wild, sprinkled in the themes of Faithful Ruslan, blended it all together and placed it in a post-apocalyptic setting to get something rather unique. So, once you've selected a species, then it will be time for research. And if you're going for verisimilitude, you really don't want to skip this step. Trust me. Otherwise you end up with unintelligent crows and Nazi magpies and it just gets messy. Right off the bat, 
the biggest things you want to get down are sociality, diet, habitat, and relationship to humans, if applicable. All of these, and especially the former in more social species, will play a major role in shaping the more speculative parts of world building, such as culture, religion, language, etc. So first, what kind of social structures do your species live in? For simplicity's sake, we can divide animal sociality into three rough categories, solitary, familial, and communal, which, by the way, are not scientific terms, and in truth this classification exists more on a spectrum. Solitary species, obviously, tend to stick to themselves, though naturally they will have to meet up with others of their kind during at least some part of the year if they want to propagate the species. Think foxes, most species of raptor, mountain lions, etc. Here, I'll also include the subcategory of paired species, who tend to mate for life but whose children disperse within a few months of birth, such as the bald eagle. Near the middle of the spectrum lie familial species, who primarily live their lives as members of a nuclear family, with a few possible additions. Grey wolves are the most widely known example here, with most packs being comprised of a mate pair and their children, occasionally bolstered by a sibling or the odd wanderer accepted into the fold. And back to birds for a moment, while most raptors are either solitary or live in mate pairs, one species, the Harris's hawk, are actually familial, hunting in packs comprised of five to seven members. So add that to the list of species someone needs to write about. I'll put it on the list. Back to canids, coyotes lie a little more to the solitary side of the spectrum, though they possess a high degree of versatility when it comes to sociality, much like with almost everything else about them. Some coyotes are solitary, some stick with a mate for multiple years but drive their pups off near the end of each summer, some congregate in family units with only a few of each year's young dispersing annually, and some form large, loosely knit packs comprising more than a dozen individuals. The case of coyotes specifically is complicated by a genetic history so tangled that it would make the genealogy of Europe's royalty look easy to understand. Coyotes themselves, Canis latrans, are likely reminiscent of the basal form of the Canidae family, being our closest extant example of what the common ancestors of themselves, wolves, dogs, and jackals existed as some 30 million years ago. But this is complicated by the fact that grey wolves, Canis lupus that is, occupied most of North America for millions of years before being extirpated by humanity, and several subspecies, or perhaps distinctive species, of wolf, including the eastern timber wolf, Canis lycaon, and the red wolf, Canis rufus, have now shared environments with the coyote for decades, resulting in those populations being gene-swamped by the more adaptable coyote and coyotes in those regions absorbing wolf-like traits into their genomes, causing cascading effects on behavior and pack formation, and I realize I'm rambling here. This is one of the subjects I studied in university. Fascinating stuff, really, and it provides a rich sandbox for societal world building to anyone wanting to write about North American canids, as we will come back to later. Anyway, on the farthest end of the spectrum we have what I'll term communal species, those that live in large groups comprised of multiple families. Think meerkats, bats, crows, rabbits, deer, and so on. The hierarchies within these communities can range from total anarchy to a rigid caste system, but often fall somewhere in the middle. Though of course, feel free to take liberties here when writing your own stories. Richard Adams certainly did regarding rabbits, and his novel is all the stronger for it. Some species even exist at multiple points on the spectrum. As mentioned earlier, coyotes can be found at almost every extreme, while with lions and cheetahs, groups of females and their young will often stick together, while males will be divided between loners and coalitions that aid each other in claiming territory and securing access to mates. Up next is the environment that your species lives in, which can also play a significant role in what their societies might look like. Do they construct elaborate dwelling places, like beavers, meerkats, or rabbits, or use simpler dens like wolves and foxes? Do they prefer dense woodland or open scrub? low-lying terrain or the high ground? Do they roam about an established range of territory, like lions, or simply wander wherever danger and foraging drive them, like deer? Do they nest in specific species or types of trees, like bald eagles, who prefer live pine or cypress? Do they live in or near water, such as otters, which dig their holts along the banks of rivers and streams, or in areas with very little water, like cheetahs? On this topic, a major factor involves the species' relationship to humanity. Not only how close they live to human-developed areas, but how much interest humanity takes in their lives. Foxes and crows, for instance, have both settled into urban and suburban life quite comfortably, but humans don't really do much about the latter, 
while the former are at fairly significant risk of being shot, chased by dogs, or hit by cars. By contrast, if you're writing about Arctic wolf packs, they don't tend to have all that much interaction with us, which incidentally can make them quite bold when encountering humans. That being said, some remote dwelling species are still highly sought after by poachers, such as the snow leopard, so distance from human civilization doesn't necessarily equal safety. Another feature that will strongly shape any animal society is their diet. Are they predatory, herbivorous, or a mix of the two? Generally speaking, prey species are more likely to live in large groups, while obligate carnivores typically live in smaller family units or hunt alone. And the status of omnivores can vary wildly, though these are broader trends rather than hard rules. Plenty of rodent species are solitary despite being herbivorous, while carnivorous African wild dogs and doles may both live in packs numbering several dozen individuals. And for those who don't know, doles are basically a specialized Indian wolf that knows how to whistle. On a related note, if your species are predatory, you will need to consider how they view and interact with other species, which segues nicely into another vital topic, language. Naturally, when writing not only xenofiction, but mythic xenofiction, writers have a large amount of leeway with presenting animal communication. It can generally be assumed that you are merely translating a complex mixture of body language, tail positioning, facial expressions, vocalizations, pheromone releases, etc. into human words simply for the audience's convenience. That being said, there are several ways that writers typically go about this within the subgenre. The first is having all animals capable of communicating with each other as if they spoke the same language. This system is most common in works aimed at younger audiences, such as the animals of Farthing Wood, since it keeps things simple and also allows for a variety of species to be featured without cluttering the story with the complexities of differing languages and dialects. Since I have such a penchant for inventing my own xenofiction terms, let's call this one the universal wild language. Humans are, of course, excluded. That's so unfair! On the opposite end of the spectrum is what I'll call differentiated wild language, whereby every species speaks its own unique language, with linguistic relations being tied to phylogeny, how close they related those species are in evolutionary terms. This approach is best exemplified by Gary Kilworth's novels Hunter's Moon, Midnight's Sun, and Frost Dancers, which star foxes, wolves, and hares, respectively. In each of the novels, taxonomical families share a common language, represented by a major human tongue, with different species in those families having different dialects. So in Hunter's Moon, Fox's speech is rendered as plain English, while dogs speak in distinct English dialects, and badgers, who are caniform carnivores distantly related to canines, speak German. Though animals are able to learn another language by living alongside other species for extended amounts of time. David Clement Davies' Firebringer utilizes a similar approach, where most animals can only understand members of their own species though the main character does gain the mystical ability to break the language barrier. This system is best for when your story features interactions between numerous species, and you specifically desire to highlight the differences between those species in order to make each feel distinctive, especially in terms of predator-prey dynamics. After all, if your predatory species are capable of conversing intelligently with the animals they eat, and are therefore able to recognize their personhood, for lack of a better term, that can raise some uncomfortable ethical questions it's far easier for your wolves to not be able to understand deer at all, so that their predatory interactions feel a lot like our own with the species we eat. It also feels more realistic to me personally, but again, given how speculative all of this is, you shouldn't feel obligated to take this approach. In fact, most mythic xenofiction takes a middle ground, having animals able to communicate with broadly similar species, often giving thick accents or unique dialects to outliers. To return to Watership Down, Richard Adams has all rabbits speak in lapine, though they are also capable of communicating on a rudimentary level with other woodland creatures such as mice and hedgehogs, and can even understand the black-headed gull Kihar, who is given a thick Norwegian accent. When will you be able to fly? I fly any time. Stand back. Likewise, in A Black Fox Running, Brian Carter describes weasels and otters as speaking with nasally accents that his foxes are nonetheless able to comprehend but doesn't have any of these caniform carnivores converse with birds or deer. Now that we've gotten all of that pesky biology out of the way, it's time to delve into the more fantastical elements of world building. Culture, government, religion, mythology, 
folklore, holidays, customs, and so on. In these areas, you have much more freedom to deviate from reality while still retaining a strong sense of verisimilitude, provided you are careful and consistent. First on the docket is what your species' social lives will look like, and how they are organized. If you're writing about primarily solitary species, such as foxes, your characters will most likely exist in loosely knit social groups that share the same general range, pairing together only during the mating and pup rearing seasons. Maybe the foxes of a region gather together in informal councils which attempt to resolve disputes or combat common threats, such as those posed by mankind, during times of hardship. With familial species such as wolves, the dominant mate pair, who are most commonly the parents or siblings of the rest of the pack, serve as leaders. Though the concept of alpha and omega wolves is actually outdated, and has more recently been argued against by L. David Meck, the very scientist who popularized the idea back in the 1970s, I don't see anything wrong with someone writing a more anthropomorphized story to take inspiration from it. Perhaps wolf society could be organized around the core of a pack, with the dominant pair leading, a single wolf serving as the right hand of the alpha, and a pseudo-outcast omega residing at the bottom of the hierarchy. Most of the young from each year disperse in order to join existing packs or found their own with other wanderers while perpetual loners retain a strong stigma against them, occasionally being accepted into another pack as a lowly omega. Two packs on neighboring land might be founded by brothers, allying against outside threats or descending into warfare when the alpha of one is overthrown by an upstart son. Or, as in the case of Ken Kaufman's Ramblefoot, an omega could be cast out of his pack into exile, only to build a new pack and return for revenge. You can even work in relationships between species, for example, crows and ravens are known to follow wolf packs in real life, feasting on the remains of their kills and potentially aiding them in locating prey. Ravens have even been observed playing with wolf pups, and now I'm picturing a xenofiction story about a small group of ravens that tags along with a wolf pack, with the leader having to balance managing not only the rule of their own flock, but their relationship with the wolves. Anyway, societal worldbuilding gains additional dimensions with communal species such as rabbits, who, because they live in larger groups, provide further opportunities to flush out full class systems, as Richard Adams did in Watership Down. In his novel, Warrens are typically ruled by a male chief, who is served by an Ausla comprised of a few particularly strong and or clever rabbits, who in turn preside over the general population, with the least fortunate of the latter being forced to the outskirts of the Warrens' territory when the population grows too large. Watership Down serves as an exceptional example of worldbuilding in basically every regard, but for now let's stick to society and government. Adam's rabbit societies vary wildly in terms of organization and internal mobility. Sandalford is dominated by a single powerful family, whose members secure access to the best food, burrows, and positions in society, and therefore produce healthier offspring, while Ephrafa is a brutal military dictatorship formerly run by a council of elders but in reality dominated by General Woundwort and his cadre of loyal officers. Watership Down itself is much more meritocratic and communal, its leaders holding power through the consent of the general population and striving for relative equality among their members. But Adams certainly doesn't have to have the last word on rabbit xenofiction. For example, you could write a story focusing on only one Warren, expanding the glimpses of the aristocratic society we see in Sandalford into a full story in its own right, of competing noble families and oppressed outskirters attempting to improve their own lot, or of a central council dominated by powerful families attempting to weather some crisis. Real-life rabbits are actually matriarchal, which is yet another angle that a writer could take to differentiate their story from Watership Down. Once you have an idea of the societies your species live in and how they are governed, if applicable, it's time to move on to what is probably the most important aspect of world-building in mythic xenofiction, religion and mythology. These two topics involve how a culture answers the biggest questions about their own existence. Where did they come from? Why are they here? How should they act? And how is existence itself ordered? Even in a society that is not religious in the traditional sense, these questions will still carry a lot of weight. When building your species' religions, you want to hit several key points. The type of theism they subscribe to, the relationship between their species and the divine, an explanation for how the world was made, and what their place in creation is, and the more day-to-day -day subjects of prayer, rituals, taboos, religious hierarchy, etc. First off is the type of theism. 
Broadly speaking, there are five classifications. Monotheistic, dualistic, polytheistic, pantheistic, and atheistic. And though I admit this leaves out a lot of nuance, and you can have a lot of overlap between them, these groupings should suffice here. Monotheism posits that there is a single supreme being, typically transcending existence rather than existing within it, as we do, being itself rather than a being. Dualism breaks the single supreme being of monotheism into two halves, often in direct conflict with one another. Polytheism features multiple independent beings, lowercase g gods, who each possess limited supernatural power over aspects of existence. Pantheism instead posits that the divine permeates all of existence, being found either in all sapient life, all life, or even just all matter. And lastly, atheism denies the existence of any transcendent and or supernatural beings or reality. As I mentioned, these five classifications are less hard categories and more generalizations. You can still have a wide variety of religions that mix and match these traits. To explain what I mean, I'll reference some real-world examples. And please understand that some of these descriptions may not be considered wholly accurate within the respective faiths. It's more just to illustrate the diversity of belief systems in layman's terms. Both Christianity and Islam are monotheistic, but the former's Trinitarianism introduces what might otherwise be considered a polytheistic element within the Supreme Being, and certain strains of Gnostic Christianity, largely suppressed early on in the Church's history as heretical, contain dualistic and even pantheistic elements. And mainstream Christianity itself has an element of dualism in its antagonism between the triune god and his fallen angel Satan, something taken even further in Manichaeanism and Zoroastrianism. Similarly, while both the Greco-Roman religion and Hinduism are polytheistic on the surface, they both contain elements of not only monotheistic theology in their concepts of the first mover or prime source and the Brahman or Godhead, respectively, but also elements of pantheism in their conceptions of demons and innate divinity. Buddhism could be argued to be either pantheistic or atheistic, and as a result is often integrated within other religions or philosophies in a manner that can seem quite surprising to followers of Abrahamic faiths. Taoism is also pantheistic, but where Buddhism focuses on abnegation in order to detach oneself from the suffering of the world and attain enlightenment, Taoism instead focuses on accepting the natural order of things in a manner vaguely reminiscent of Islam's concept of submission to the divine will. And of course, Atheism itself ranges from an absolute denial of any non-material phenomenon to a looser belief that there are no conscious supernatural entities, with an allowance for a spiritual dimension of life, and even strains that believe God or gods did exist at one point but have since died, been killed, or even killed themselves in order to create the universe. To translate this to xenofiction, your species could worship a single god of their species, while recognizing the existence of other species' respective gods, a subsection of polytheism known as henotheism, or they could associate their own personal god with the supreme being, or perhaps they don't recognize the existence of any gods, instead venerating a pantheon of ancestral heroes whose lives are viewed as examples to follow. Or maybe they see the divine in all things, and believe in reincarnation, with behavior in this life affecting how they will be reincarnated in the next. If you want to write a dualistic religion, you could use the more traditional good versus evil framework, but you don't have to. Imagine a herbivorous culture who believes in a god of predators and a god of prey, something that might seem a little lacking in nuance to omnivores. And of course, since it's your own story, it's up to you, the author, to determine how true all of this is within your work. You could outright confirm the existence of the supernatural, allude to it vaguely, or simply display your species' religious beliefs without acknowledging whether or not they're factually true. Branching off from this is the relationship between your species and the divine. Are they a chosen people, beloved of God or the gods, or are they cursed because of the actions of their ancestors, outlaws to the divine? Or, like in Christianity, are they a mix of both? Are they simply one species among many, none of whom are particularly favored? Was their own god killed by a rival, leaving them defenseless against their enemies? Your species' view of their own relationship with the divine will go a long way towards illuminating two other vital aspects of cultural worldbuilding, a creation myth and a theological sense of purpose, both of which can easily tie in to one another. To return once more to Watership Down, a sentence I have probably said way too many times over the last year, in the rabbit's creation myth, the sun god Frith creates the world and peoples it with various species, 
making them all equals capable of sustaining themselves on plants. But when the rabbit population grows out of control, and the vain Prince Elahrera refuses to heed Frith's warnings, God punishes them by making many other species carnivorous in order to limit their numbers, balancing this by gifting rabbits swiftness and cunning to even the scales. You might even take the mirrored approach of writing about a carnivorous species who sees it as their divinely mandated duty to protect the world through predation, or feature herbivores who believe that the gods want their species to colonize as much of the world as possible, and view predators as demons. Here, as in most cases, looking to existing human creation myths can be a great inspiration for crafting your own, provided you put a unique spin on them. Also, if the species you are writing about has a very specific, unique trait, that could easily factor into their creation myth and sense of purpose. In other words, I am once again asking for someone to write a story about those Australian fire eagles. And once you have your species' religious purpose, be it to follow the laws of God or the gods, maintain a balance in nature, or simply survive as long as possible, this leads quite nicely into the more everyday substance of religions. Prayers, customs, rituals, taboos, and the societal roles associated with them. If you are writing about species that live in large groups, perhaps a small number in each herd, warren, or flock belong to a priestly class, one that could be comprised only of members of one sex, mostly dwelling apart from the other castes, or be integrated fully into general society. Or if writing about pack-based animals like wolves or coyotes, maybe the head of each pack takes on the more standard religious duties, while wandering mystics travel between the packs to perform more specific functions and provide counsel. Gary Kilworth does something similar with his foxes in Hunter's Moon, as does Brian Carter in A Black Fox Running. Moving beyond this, what does prayer look like in your species' culture? Is it private or communal? Ritualized or personalized? Rare or commonplace? Are there any rituals associated with certain times of year, or specific events, such as choosing mates, hunting, or when an individual dies? On the flip side, do any taboos exist, such as cannibalism, infanticide, or even approaching humans? In terms of customs and taboos, you can go even further by having these differ from region to region among members of the same species, or between two similar species that live in the same area, in order to generate interesting conflict. Perhaps cannibalism is considered horrific by wolves, a desecration of their people's holy flesh, but sacred to coyotes, an honorable way for scavengers to avoid letting anything go to waste. This could even be cited as a reason for the real-world antagonism between the two species. And, as an aside, this is one of the many benefits of research. You never know what quirks of nature might inspire some really interesting world-building choices. To delve more into taboo-based conflict, especially in stories featuring communal species such as rabbits, moles, or deer, certain societies may belong to different denominations or sects of the same broader religion, viewing similar stories, figures, rituals, or behaviors in very different ways. If you choose to explore this route, which honestly has tons of potential, and hasn't been utilized nearly as much as it should be in xenofiction, at least to my knowledge, it can help to once again look to real-world religions for inspiration, such as the many offshoots of Christianity suppressed as heretical by the mainstream Nicene churches, including Gnosticism, Arianism, Catharism, the Marcionites, the Bogomils, the Paulicians, among many, many others. Side note, taking bits and pieces from these can also be a great resource for writers who want to avoid their constructed religions feeling generic, in the way that many medieval fantasy stories just feature Catholicism with a few names swapped. Back to taboos, they could even exist for less obvious things, like members of a society with a strict caste system choosing mates from another class, or consuming certain types of food at certain types of year. Don't be afraid to get creative here. Goodness knows we humans have enough weird taboos of our own. Also, keep in mind that while the distinction between things associated overtly with religion and those not considered explicitly religious is likely to be quite blurry in less advanced societies, not all taboos and customs need to be religious in nature. Speaking of which, let's touch on holidays, the English word for which derives from the term holy day. It's not necessary to have your species recognize any holidays, and it may make more sense in some cases than others, but when implemented properly, they can serve as yet another unique element of your world building. Imagine songbirds who commemorate the time just before a migratory journey, ravens returning to a specific tree on the night of the winter solstice, rabbits who celebrate the beginning of spring, or wolf packs coming together one last time to see off their young of that year as they disperse in late summer. 
And lastly, we come to folklore and cultural heroes, which often began as an offshoot of more grandiose religious myths. El Herrera himself, the archetypal example in xenofiction, features in both religious stories about the creation of the world and more mundane episodes of trickery and amusement. When creating folklore for your species, it can be heavily religious in nature, exist separately from said religious stories, or blur the line between them. Take, for instance, the Arthurian cycle, which originated from pagan Welsh stories that gradually incorporated Christian aspects over time, even as it retained non-biblical elements like fairies and Celtic sorcerers. Folklore and the associated heroes and villains who star in it can help to greatly expand upon what traits and behaviors your species value, be they underhanded tricksters or conquering warriors, as well as allow readers to become further immersed in your setting. After all, storytelling is one of the oldest arts of human civilization, technically even preceding civilization, at least as we usually think of it, and so giving your species an extensive cycle of stories, or at least creating the illusion that one exists, even if we only glimpse it from time to time in the actual narrative, can do wonders for your work. If you decide to write about lions, it would make sense for them to revere a cultural hero who is exceptionally strong, able to secure and defend a pride from rivals, while ravens, on the other hand, might feature a brutish character as a villain who is often outsmarted by a weaker, yet more cunning, hero. Figures from folklore might even be celebrated as the source of some of a species' unique traits. The first coyote to howl, the first beaver to construct a dam, the first black kite to make use of fire for hunting, and seriously, why hasn't someone written a story about these yet? So, with all of that background work out of the way, I hope I've given any aspiring mythic xenofiction writers out there a lot to chew on. But it's not done yet. That's because we've reached part two, where I'd like to take things one step further and brainstorm a few concepts for xenofiction cultures. And, as I mentioned near the beginning of this video, feel free to take any of these ideas and run with them, especially the one about the Australian fire eagles. I'm begging you, there is a lamentable lack of good bird xenofiction out there, and a surprising surplus of bad stuff. First off, let's start with something simple, understandable, and popular. The Grey Wolf. Hey, I don't know if I like you this close, you get back! Don't worry. Wolves already feature in plenty of mythic xenofiction, as well as mythic-influenced realist works, so I think this is also a good example for writers who want to work with a species that has already been extensively featured. Never feel discouraged just because someone else got there first. Like I said, even Richard Adams himself wasn't the first person to write a xenofiction book about rabbit societies coming into conflict. He just put a number of very unique spins on the concept and told his tale very, very well. Looking at Grey Wolves, the central social unit is the pack, typically composed of a mate pair, their children of that year, one to three children from prior years, more likely to be daughters than sons, perhaps a sibling of one of the leaders, and possibly a former loner or two that the pack picked up. From this, we can extrapolate for the purposes of world building. Wolves believe that it is proper to live within a pack, and crucial that pack mates know their place and respect the hierarchy, which consists of several roles. The dominant male, or alpha, and his mate, the mitera. The vita, who serves the alpha as second in command, advisor, and bodyguard. The koyeni, who make up the rank and file of the pack. The omegas, who exist at the bottom of the hierarchy and the Paraplans, or Packless, who wander between established territories for various reasons, trying either to find a pack that will accept them, meet other fellow outcasts to form a pack together, or simply survive on their own. You may have noticed that I'm using corrupted Greek here instead of the traditional Latin-based terms, just to give this a bit more of a unique flair, and also to avoid the connotation of alphas and betas which has sort of been ruined by meme culture. Of course, there's no reason that there can't be some dynamism within packs. Sometimes the alpha will be female rather than male, and occasionally the vita will also be the alpha's mate, though these arrangements might be controversial in wolf culture. As I said, it's up to writers to decide on taboos and customs. Some packs may not contain any outcasts, while others may be more welcoming of wanderers. Certain packs may treat the lowest ranking members more as gestures owed a certain respect while others may relentlessly bully them as a scapegoat for the pack's problems. A select few of the packless may even be celebrated as mystics, who travel between packs dispensing advice and wisdom, though perhaps some less scrupulous, or just plain desperate, wolves may pretend to be such sages in the hopes of getting a hospitable welcome and a free meal. The Grey Wolf is no stranger to conflict with humanity, 
and so it follows naturally that their culture and religion will reflect this. It is extremely taboo to fraternize with either humans or dogs, the latter of whom are seen as traitors to their own kind. The mere sign of human activity is enough to frighten most wolves off, while preying on livestock enjoys a mixed reputation. Some see it as righteous revenge for the injustices inflicted on their kind by men, while others, particularly those who live near developed areas, recognize how dangerous it is to invite retribution from their two-legged foes. In the wolves' religion, their kind ruled the world in the time before man under the blessings of the moon goddess, an era they remember as the Wild Reign. But with the dawn of human civilization began a long war, in which the wilderness, and the wolves who ruled it, were steadily driven back. In this conflict, many of their own kind betrayed their primal heritage for a place of servitude at mankind's side, becoming the first dogs, and helping in the war against their former kin. Wolves subscribe to a dualistic theology involving the sun, Ilios, and the moon, Fingari. The latter they worship as goddess of creation and guardian of their own kind, while the sun god is associated with both their herbivorous prey and their greatest enemy, humanity. Wolves believe that with the rise of human civilization, Fengari is locked in perpetual battle with Ilios, always dying only to be reborn again, shepherding the souls of the departed into the night sky, where they can be seen as stars. These they revere as the pantheon of ancestral heroes, who they believe still have some power over the world and those who dwell within it. Specific figures representing certain traits are prayed to for strength, guidance, aid, and so on. Ravens are viewed as messengers of the goddess, treated with a mixture of awe and fear, both for their association with death and decay, and with how they move much more easily among humankind. Still, their penchant for trailing wolf packs to aid in locating prey in order to feed on scraps leads to them often being seen as a good omen, and a select few wolves may even develop some limited ability to communicate with ravens by interpreting their calls and movements. On the other hand, coyotes and foxes are seen as duplicitous given how they thrive in humanity's shadow, while wolves have been driven to the ends of the earth. It is not unusual for wolves to kill their smaller cousins whenever they encounter them, and to return to our earlier example, wolves abhor cannibalism as one of the vilest taboos, while coyotes share no such hesitancy only exacerbating tensions between the two closely related species. The wolves of North America remember the various subspecies that once roamed the continent as great tribes, each composed of many packs, who would alternately war and associate with one another, but failed to unite in the face of man's threat. Lamenting this failure, wolf culture prizes obedience to elders, so long as they demonstrate the strength to lead, and harshly condemns those who needlessly disrupt the order and stability of the pack seen as the greatest defense against total annihilation. Taking this example a bit further, we can develop cultures for both coyotes and ravens within this world, much in the way that Gary Kilworth did for foxes, wolves, and hares in his loose trilogy's shared setting. Coyotes are essentially the New World counterpart to jackals, a wolf-like canid that is smaller, more socially versatile, and far more adaptable than their larger cousins. While wolves have been extirpated from most of their former North American range, coyotes have rushed in to fill the void. So to build culturally off of this, coyote society is far less rigid than that of wolves. Some live in large, informal packs held together loosely by a particularly strong or cunning individual, some live in small family-based packs, and some survive on their own, only enjoying company during the mating and pup-rearing seasons. Rather than the complex and formal hierarchy of wolves, coyote packs merely recognize a chief and his or her stalwart the latter of whom serves much the same role as a vita in a wolf pack. And given their complex genetic history, with the coyotes of much of the eastern seaboard tending to possess some wolf ancestry as a result of gene swamping and crossbreeding in the St. Lawrence River Basin, where wolves still roam, coyotes in this region tend towards more wolf-like behaviors, including a stronger affinity for pack life and settled territory. In terms of religion, coyotes practice much the same faith as wolves, only in a far less complex manner suiting their wandering, freer nature. The comparison is somewhat like the relationship between the Greek and Roman pantheons, only simplified in this case. Where wolves recognize dozens, if not hundreds of heroes and tales, coyotes have a much more condensed pantheon and folkloric cycle, and view the advance of human civilization less as a catastrophe and more as an opportunity that gave them the chance to turn the tables on their former oppressors. You could even have the coyotes believe themselves to be in some way involved in this, 
with a Promethean fire-stealing myth in which they aided human advancement to spite wolves, that serves as their explanation for why wolves in turn hate them so much. To coyotes, the Ilios and Fingari of wolf religion are simply the sun and moon, who each play their part in maintaining the balance of the natural world, the former in providing life, and the latter by shepherding the souls of the departed from the world. And where the folklore of wolves places themselves as the proud guardians of the wilderness, chosen people of the moon goddess, coyotes see themselves as perpetual outcasts, introduced into creation by the gods long after other species had already secured homes for themselves, only now thriving on account of their own fortune and wit, with their greatest cultural figure being not a noble warrior, but a cunning trickster. With all of this material, you have the groundwork for myriad stories, such as a wolf pack moving south to resettle land abandoned long ago by their kind, who come into conflict with newly settled coyotes, young coyotes near the limits of their kind's range, venturing further north to try to establish territory of their own, coming into conflict with the native wolves, packs of both kinds living in relative harmony where their ranges have overlapped for decades, as new packs of hybrid coy wolves emerge, coyotes living in the American South, having to deal with packs of dominant koi wolves pushing down along the eastern seaboard, threatening to displace or conquer them. A lone wolf, cast out from his or her pack, who decides to make a dangerous expedition to their pack's ancestral land much farther south, in order to prove their worth to their ancestors. A lone coyote mystic traveling across the continent, encountering members of both species. Or even a wandering pair of mystics, one coyote and one wolf who journey around attempting to resolve disputes between their respective kinds, all the while engaging in good-natured debate over their religious and cultural differences. And that's more or less off the top of my head. Also, coyotes have been known to cooperate with badgers and even possibly share den sites, as the latter do with foxes in Europe, so anyone who wants to work with these concepts could try fitting that into their world-building somewhere as well. Now before I move on to a standalone concept, there's one more species I'd like to fit into this particular setting or, more accurately, two closely related groups of species, and that is ravens and crows. Ravens have a long history of symbiosis with wolves, and given that coyotes have essentially supplanted the niche that wolves used to occupy across much of North America, it would make sense for them to have some interaction with coyote packs as well, under the right circumstances. Running with the existing lore I've already established, we'll say that most ravens, naturally, do not associate with wolves or coyotes, but smaller bands occasionally do. Larger corvid communities might view these cross-species interactions with reverence, scorn, or indifference. As with human cultures, views on a specific topic can vary wildly from place to place. Ravens who live with a wolf pack are guided by a seer, who is capable of some form of communication with their benefactors. I'll leave this up to writers to determine whether the communication is rendered as full-on speech or simply interpretations of signs, body language, etc. Where wolves view accompanying ravens with a mixture of respect and fear, associating them with both death and prey, the ravens in turn see the wolves as a cross between providers and dependents. A raven seer will typically single out a specific wolf within the pack, sometimes the alpha but occasionally another, who is able to most effectively communicate with them, known to the ravens as a speaker. And the system by which they lead wolves to prey and then wait afterwards for a share of the remains can be full of ritual and prayer. Associations with coyotes could be quite similar, or much less formal. I'll leave it to you to decide for yourselves. As for the majority of ravens, who never interact with wolves and probably only have passing encounters with coyotes, they tend to live in small family units, occasionally grouping together in the winter. But since I'd rather work with a more communal species this time, here is where I'll jump over to crows, and more specifically the American crow, whose group sizes can range from a handful of individuals to flocks of thousands especially during colder months of the year. We'll establish that for our setting, crows tend to live in communities known as colonies, of which the fundamental unit is the family, headed by a mate pair, known individually as a patron and matron, and collectively referred to as a crown. Individual colonies may be composed of anywhere from a handful of families up to several hundred, and within a colony, family ties are usually maintained for several generations. The children of each crown typically establish nests near those of their parents, with some offspring dispersing and others remaining to carry their family name, which is usually passed matrilineally. As an aside, with most avian species, especially raptors, females tend to be larger and stronger than males, and though corvids are relatively egalitarian, 
for the purposes of this project, I'll assume that they still often follow the avian custom of female precedence. Colonies are governed in a system of familial democracy, by which each established family receives a single vote in a governing council, presided over by a regent, who is elected from among the crowns. In some colonies, this system may be quite rigid, while others, particularly those in urban environments subjected to different pressures, might do away with the system altogether and govern either through direct democracy or authoritarian control. Crow society is divided into several classes, with the patrons and matrons of each family at the top, their own offspring in the middle, and outskirters, who join the colony rather than being born into it, usually hoping to secure a mate from the rank and file of the flock, at the bottom. But separate from this exists a small class of seers, a religious class of crows who devote themselves to keeping their customs, remembering their folklore and history, and engaging in theology and philosophy, typically remaining celibate, but occasionally taking a mate from amongst their own caste. Seers do not vote in the council, but are called upon to provide advice, and preside over any official gatherings, including votes, elections, celebrations, unions, births, and deaths. One fascinating real-world behavior that crows engage in involves gathering around the carcass of one of their own, and on rare occasions even cannibalizing their dead, which provides plenty of material for cultural world-building. Our crows will be animistic, believing that spirits, also known as demons, a term derived from the classical Greek conception, inhabit all things. And the more ancient or powerful something is, from the sun and moon to a particularly old and storied tree, the stronger its corresponding demon is. Their lives are therefore full of ritual and reverence to the environments around them, the winds that they use to traverse the skies, the sun that gives life and warmth, the moon that watches over the night, rivers that flow through their territory, and so on. In their creation myth, the world was hatched from a great egg. Their heroes of folklore range from great warriors defending sacred sites from raptors to thieves plundering neighboring colonies, and from wise seers pondering the mysteries of the universe to noble mothers sacrificing themselves to protect their own nests. As a part of their culture, crows gather to mourn their dead, performing a ritual to commemorate their souls melding into the winds, merging back with the divine essence of the world. And in the cases of particularly revered individuals, allowing them to live on through the community's surviving members. Cannibalism could therefore be a right of respect, reserved for only a select few, though perhaps not all crow colonies would share this view. All of this gives us a foundation for numerous potential stories. A raven seer who must start a new life when the wolf pack they follow is killed. An outcast crow who attempts to befriend a coyote in hopes of finding a better life. A war between two rival colonies of crows, perhaps with different societal systems, or a conflict within a colony between rival powerful families, competing for the title of regent after the former leader's death. Upheaval among a specific crow colony when their sacred home site is threatened by human construction, a young crow attempting to challenge some prevailing custom of their colony that they see as unfair, or the seers of a specific colony of crows passing down an ancient prophecy concerning the end of the world, which could then be interpreted or misinterpreted by their regent with varying results. I think I'll do one more, this time completely divorced from this shared setting, and to help illustrate my point about being able to work with species that have already featured prominently in other people's stories, this time we'll brainstorm a society for rabbits. Like I said earlier, I love Richard Adams' work, but there's no reason we need to give him the last word on the species. However, rather than his European rabbit, or Octologus cuniculus, we'll be working with the North American Eastern Cottontail. Silvalagus floridanus. Returning to the concepts I alluded to earlier, for this exercise our rabbit societies will be matriarchal, controlled either by a single dominant matriarch or a smaller number of aristocratic families, each headed by a matron. Offspring, particularly smaller males, are shunted to the outskirts of society and encouraged to disperse in order to join other flagging warrens, establish their own, or simply be condemned to wander the dangerous wilds. In terms of class systems, most warrens contain their nobility, which may be comprised of a single ruling family or a few likely interrelated ones, an Ausla-like class of warriors and bodyguards, I'll leave it to you to come up with your own name, the rank and file of the warren, and outcasts on the fringes of society. A separate priestly class is also common, maintaining customs, remembering their people's history, leading the warren in communal prayers, performing rituals, and so on. To branch off further from Watership Down, 
When it comes to religion and myth, our rabbits will see their plight at the bottom of the food chain as punishment by a vengeful god who gives them no assurances about continued survival in the manner that Frith does, with different religious sects interpreting this in various ways. Most commonly, it is assumed that their ancestors committed some heinous sin that is responsible for their present threatened existence, with their greatest cultural hero being not a scheming trickster, but a matriarch who humbles herself before the divine, almost like a rabbit version of Job, and encourages her children to do the same, in order to avoid bringing any kind of attention, be it from predators or the heavens themselves. By respecting the rule of law and practicing moral behavior, these rabbits believe they can atone for their ancient sin and be granted access to a paradise free of predators in the next life. But our rabbit society is rife with sectarian religious conflict. One growing sect, viewed as heretical by most ruling classes, sees the god of this world as an evil deity inflicting unjustified suffering on their kind, similarly to the Gnostic view of the Demiurge, a belief which was adopted by Marcionite Christianity. These rabbits instead revere a much later prophet that they believe was sent by a higher power beyond the god of this world, in order to liberate their souls, who advocates for the abolition of ruling hierarchies, abandoning old religious traditions, and developing a personal relationship with the divine essence. Some offshoots of this sect encourage their followers to avoid having children, and one particularly radical group even follows a practice known as catharsis, by which rabbits perform some extended ritual penance or cleansing ceremony, possibly including a pilgrimage to a sacred site, before allowing themselves to be eaten by predators, a process which they believe ensures their salvation. With all of this as a backdrop to work against, several story concepts that come to mind include a wandering mystic who travels between warrens all over the countryside, dispensing wisdom and helping to resolve conflicts, who uncovers the existence of a new, mysterious religious sect that they begin investigating, a respected matriarch dying suddenly, leaving her warren's leadership to be contested by two rival daughters with competing claims, leading to division within the community that threatens to break out into open war, outcast males living on the outskirts of an overcrowded warren being enticed by a preacher from a heretical religious sect who is fomenting revolution, following a single aged wanderer, reflecting on their storied past as they embark on a pilgrimage of catharsis, with the central tension involving whether or not they will ultimately follow the sacrament to its completion, or a conflict between two neighboring warrens over grazing rights during a drought, into which all kinds of religious and political conflict could be introduced. All of this should hopefully be enough to give any aspiring xenofiction writers out there a place to start, or at least an idea of how to begin constructing your own fictional animal societies. But don't hesitate to consider using more obscure species or subspecies that don't get enough love in literature. You might find yourself interested in writing about the Ethiopian wolf, which lives in isolated mountainous regions of eastern Africa and is currently threatened by overzealous shepherds, or the red wolf, which lived throughout the American Deep South until it was hunted to extinction in the wild, managing to cling to survival only through extensive preservation efforts. You could even set your story in the 1940s or 50s, when the species was rapidly declining but still possessed a decent population size. After all, nothing says your xenofiction story has to take place in the present. David Clement Davies' books about deer and wolves are set in the Middle Ages. In the latter portion of this video, I've mainly focused on species I'm familiar with, but some other species I think would be really neat to see featured in mythic xenofiction are the Harris's hawk, the pack-hunting species of raptor I briefly mentioned earlier, cheetahs, just because they're so aesthetic, otters, which aren't particularly social but are quite intelligent and have the unique quality of being mammals that live in and around rivers, and rats whose significant intelligence, high degree of sociality, and possession of grasping digits could make for some very interesting and complex societal world building, especially in a post-apocalyptic setting. I'm imagining a more realistic proto-red wall where rats are just beginning to form human-style societies, sort of like a cross between a canticle for Leibowitz, inherit the earth, and watership down. By the way, here's some fun little trivia. That post-apocalyptic concept is actually a holdover from the original script for this video which was going to be about which species might evolve to replace us and develop a human-style civilization if humanity, and all other primate species, went extinct. I couldn't figure out a way to make the video work in that form, and I figured this would have more relevance to people hoping to write their own xenofiction, but I may return to the concept one day if I can figure out how to make it work. That was also why this video took longer than expected to complete. I did a lot of research before realizing I'd need to change gears. Oh, and speaking of interesting species, there's also the black kite, of course. 
but I'm going to save my own ideas for that one, because I'm thinking I want to write a story of my own with them. Anyway, I hope this was helpful to any aspiring xenofiction writers out there. Like I said, call me the anti-Disney, because all of these ideas are public domain. We've got to have money. Feel free to take any of them and run with it. Tolkien and Lewis once said, if no one is writing the stories we want to read, we'll just have to write them ourselves. And I see no reason not to adopt that same mindset in xenofiction. I want to see decentralized communities of polytheistic songbirds, Taoist Corsac foxes who believe in reincarnation, lion coalitions roaming the savanna as they practice a monotheistic faith with animistic characteristics, and atheist urban raccoons seeing the rise of a new religion as they begin to congregate in larger social groups. Don't be afraid to get creative. In the meantime, if you're looking for a new xenofiction read, you could always check out my recently published debut novel, Winter Without End, a post-apocalyptic story about a dog who makes a deal with a wounded wolf in order to survive which is available now in both paperback and ebook formats from Fenris Publishing. As always, links are in the description. If you want to support the channel in other ways, you can leave a like and comment, subscribe to see more, follow me on Twitter for updates, and support me on Patreon if you have a little spare cash. Also, a special thanks to KippyCube for letting me use their awesome artwork in the thumbnail. Thanks for watching, and good luck with your writing. You know how I love to throw around that fancy verisimilitude term, right? I dare say this novel is quite verisimilitudinous.